Urza just released a long-awaited update about the XL, and there is so much to talk about. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. We're going to be talking all about the latest update from Joe Prusa and the entire Prusa staff, all about the Prusa XL. If you like that kind of content and you want to stay up to date, make sure to leave a like and get subscribed. It helps the channel out a bunch. Joe knows that it's been quite a bit, and if you join any of the Prusa lives, it's very much an XL when in the comments. It was mini Wi-Fi when... Of course, that's already happened. And there are some pretty obvious problems going on here. And I don't blame Prusa for any of them, for the most part. The bulk of it is just literally dealing with supply chain problems. They are both testing and dealing with production that is heavily affected by the supply chain problems. Any of you that have tried to get electronics recently, especially Raspberry Pis, uh, by the way, Best Buy is normally one of the better places to get them if you need them just like now, but apparently Adafruit restocks Wednesday or Thursday. Use that to whatever advantage you would like. But even a company as large as Prusa, someone that is buying tens of thousands of components, does not have the connections that they need to succeed. And what does that mean? It means delays. And for those who say, oh, look, it's another Prusa delay. Hey, why don't you try to build it yourself? It's obviously no secret I'm a bit of a Prusa fanboy, and I am probably going to be a little bit easier on them than I would be on other companies. So take that with a grain of salt, because I believe that what they're doing is valuable. And I believe that their extended time range because they're refusing to use clone components is valuable to myself as a consumer and to myself as a business, right? There's value in having real components when you can. But here's the deal. They've even got their own SMT manufacturing line. That is surface mount transistor, as far as I'm aware. And even still, they're having problems, right? When you build your own way to produce circuit boards and ICs and that kind of thing, you're clearly trying to vertically integrate. And traditionally, that was to control costs, right? When you're the one making all the components, you don't deal with other people's margins. It's quite literally your own margins and nobody else's. With Prusa, I think it's more to deal with supply chain problems, both, you know, past, current, and likely future. That is a little scary when you look at doing big projects like this, because if you can't control those things, you've got a problem. That means lots of money spent very quickly and people especially that are needed to make this kind of thing happen very, very fast. Now, Prusa is obviously not going to get too deep into what they're using and how they're doing it just yet. And I'm not even sure this one is going to be 100% open source, to be honest with you. It'll be curious to see because there's a lot of really cool tech going in here, but they do talk about Hall Effect sensors as well as one wire serial EEPROM chips and STM32 chips. And as they're saying, some of these components can have lead times between one and two years. And you don't want to use the low quality knockoffs, as Prusa says, because, well, it's going to be a problem. It works totally fine for your cheap consumer grade electronics like the lights behind me that very easily use just generic chips and I have a little remote to control it. When you're doing something like a $4,500 to $5,000 machine after shipping, fully kitted out of course, you can't just use the bottom of the barrel components, right? You're building a premium machine, it needs to use premium components. They understand that. And you can see it right here. I think it goes without saying, we do not want to use any clones, either GD32 versus STM32. Because while they might look good on paper, the reality is often vastly different. I feel that in my soul. Prusa wants to get the best product out, and because of that, they're somewhat delayed, and it kind of sucks, but it is what it is. And I laugh at this next paragraph because they are using multiple people to try to source the same components. And oftentimes they're bidding on the same lots of stuff and they're just outbidding each other, which means there's going to be some extra costs involved, which means that yes, it is as bad as people say it is, but I have a feeling it might be getting better. That's another talk for another day. If you guys want to hear more about my feelings regarding supply chain, the economy, and where things are going in the future, or at least the next few months, let me know down in those comments. Maybe we'll do a Patreon-only video or something where I talk about it, because it is very much not 3D printing focused. But it is something interesting to hear it from other people. And because of these manufacturing setbacks, Prusa has to postpone production. Now, they're hoping for just a few months. I'm going to be a little bit realistic here and say 
December is likely not going to happen. My expectation is that these problems are going to continue at least for a few more months. And unless they're basically waiting to drop the boards and chips into the printers, I don't think that the beginning of December for delivery dates or starting delivery dates is honestly realistic. And if you don't want to have your $200 held that long, go ahead and refund it. But here's the deal. There were a lot of people that bought these machines. In fact, the next paragraph states that it might take up to six months to fulfill just the day one pre-orders. So if you were two, three weeks late, you might be waiting a little bit. And for some of us, that's like, hey, great. It gives me more time to actually make the money to buy the printer. But I believe that that $200 goes a long way to helping Prusa kind of work with what they need to. It's not all doom and gloom. A lot of the changes have been things that it doesn't really make sense to show us from my understanding. That it's to increase the print quality, the reliability, the little things, right? Whether it's a little firmware tweaks or something like that. It means that they're adding more sensors and more sensors mean more data and more data means more reliability or at least a better understanding if there are failures where exactly they're coming from and why. Let's take a look. The next Nextruder. Now, I'm a little bummed about this, and I'm sure those of you that saw the beautiful gif of the Cycloid gearbox in the original Nextruder might be a little bummed to know that the Cycloid gearbox is no more, and they've gone with a planetary gearbox. Planetary gearboxes are honestly quite a bit more affordable to produce. I'm guessing they're gonna use a powdered metal sintering process that should enable this to be done relatively easily to them. There is a little backlash involving the planetary gears, but it's reliable and consistent, which means it all can be adapted for in firmware. I will be curious to see if they still choose to have that eyeglass so you can actually see the extruder moving because even planetary systems are pretty darn cool. And if any of you have used a drill that has a two speed or even three speed on the older systems, that's normally done by physically moving a sun and planets. Yes, it's why it's called a planetary gearbox. There are suns, there are planets, it's a thing. But Clearly, the planetary system is more robust, right? If cycloid gearboxes made sense, we would see them on more consumer-grade power tools, but we don't. And my guess is there's some manufacturing issues, some tolerance issues, and maybe even some longevity issues. And so I do believe that the planetary system is better. But they've also now added an accelerometer. So not only are you dealing with force and strain gauges, you now have accelerometers, which if those of you have seen anything about the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon that has this weird system where it vibrates the printer like crazy, that is tuning its vibrations and its oscillations to allow it to print faster without oscillating. And that means less ghosting. And that is something that should work incredibly well on the Prusa XL. And they've even replaced the X and Y motors with something that is stronger and faster. So you're talking about reliability at speed. And when it comes to businesses, time is money. And when it comes to consumers, we're a little impatient. So time is just patience. And if we can run something faster, if we can be more efficient in the way that we run things, then everybody wins, especially if the price doesn't change. And one of the things that they are teasing us, if they're not giving us any of the goods just yet, is a high flow nozzle that will be available at release. That's all they tell us. So I'm excited. I'm hoping it's something like a CHT style or uh, I'm a little hesitant on the volcano. I think the longer melt zone is just a bit of a pain in the butt to deal with. It sucks with retractions, personally. They're also telling us a little bit more about this 16 individual piece heat bed. It is actually controlled by its own motherboard because it needs to be smart. It will work with the slicer itself, obviously going to be Prusa slicer, to know where your part is going to be. So it doesn't have to turn on the whole dang bed and it can only heat the areas where your parts might be. So if you have a part up in one corner and nowhere else, it's just going to heat that corner and it will be just fine. So this might give us a new kind of lease on where you want to put parts. Because if you put it in the dead center, you'll have to heat up all four squares around that center. But if you put it off to the side a little bit, you might only need to heat up one of those squares, giving you significantly lower power needs, which is gonna be a thing because the Prusa XL is expected to draw near one kilowatt, which is a ton of power. 
If you're looking to use more than one of these on a circuit, you're gonna have a bad time, especially here in the States at 120 volts AC. This is a thing that I don't know if I wasn't just willing to accept initially, or maybe I didn't see it coming, but that's gonna be an issue for power demands. We are likely gonna have to have a couple of dedicated outlets dropped into our shop here just to handle something like the XL and some other machines. But if you're not doing a full print bed of parts, you should be able to keep your heat cost down quite a bit, thereby reducing your overall needs for power. Now, what we found, and we found this with the Mini when we did 3D printing in a car, we'll cart to that video so you guys can take a look, is that they really don't draw a ton of power when they're already running. The Mini drew 143 watts as it heated up, but as it was running, it was somewhere in the 60 to 85 watt range. So for a machine like this, we would expect it to draw a ton of power as it's heating up, especially if it's a big piece. But then as you're printing, you're probably just going to need a little bit of power, maybe four to 500 watts rather than the full thousand. So at least that's good. But because of this special motherboard, the printer knows precisely what is the power output of every tile and can adjust it to be very, very precise and consistent with temperature. It's pretty darn cool. And the power supply is obviously something that they're a little bit concerned about as well. Right now, if any of you have seen pictures of the back of the XL, it's actually using three of the current power supplies that they use on the Mark III S's. And that's likely because, well, they're on the shelf and they're easy to take off and use, but they do have to decide if they're going to use two or three smaller power supplies with a lower wattage or just go with a single big chungus to get the job done. Me personally, as long as it's one plug, I don't exactly care. So if they go with two or three smaller ones, maybe they provide a triple tap or a double tap power cord so that you're only using one plug from the wall. And I know that, that seems a little bit odd, but when you're running multiple printers like this, hilariously, plugs are at an all time need for real estate. And there's only so many times you can use power strips before you start feeling a little bit worried. So as long as it's one plug in the wall, that's all I really care about. We can also see that because the bounding box will be known to the slicer itself, mesh bed leveling will only be performed in the area that you're going to be printing in. Now, I don't know if that's gonna be a big deal or not. Part of me says just do the entire print bed. I'm not really too concerned that it's gonna take a little bit longer. Like we run the most amount of points that we can on our Mark III S's, which is 49, it's a seven by seven. And we make sure to hit that point five times because I want as accurate as possible for my bed level. I'll be very curious to see how this works in the production atmosphere, but you know, I am a little skeptical. And I do love something. And I think this was pointed out in our first XL video that we kind of covered it in. We'll card to it so you guys can take a look. That is PCI Express. Now, I don't know if they're using a PCI PCI Express bus to get all this done. If they are using motherboards and processors and all that, it might make sense that they use PCI as a bus control system. However, they might just be using that as a standard because the connectors are easily available and you can honestly do whatever pinout you want on them as long as it's consistent throughout the entire system. I do like that because it will quickly and efficiently allow you to change parts should anything go wrong. It seems like a big benefit to me. We can also see here a little GIF of the XL running and you can see how much faster the tool changing actually is. And yes, for those astute out there will notice that there is a bit of a purge block or wipe tower. That has been one of the big problems with the MMU. And it's honestly one of the reasons why I haven't really gotten too deep into doing MMU printing. That and sometimes they can be a bit of a disaster, although I would love to check it out. So if you guys do want me to take a look at the MMU 2S or maybe it's predecessor, whenever that comes out, let me know. We can add that to the content calendar. But this is much faster than what we've previously seen. It was much, much, much slower. We'll see if I, if I can find a video. We'll put it on screen so you guys can take a look side by side. But this to me looks like at least half of the time. And they're saying that the tool change time went from 10 seconds to around three to four. So my estimation is roughly correct there. Now, the purge block does not seem to be anywhere near 
as bad as what we'd be used to. And that's because you have, in this case, black in one nozzle and white in the other. But it is good to do an initial wipe to make sure that you have your extruder fully primed and ready to print. Those of you that use something like a iDex printer will know that a lot of times they just tend to have a waste area or like on the bamboo lab, they have a poop chute where it poops out little squiggly lines of material. For Prusa, they're just doing it on the bed. I think that works out. But as we can see, there are a lot of things to still show, which include printing speed, soluble support, which is something I am incredibly excited for. Soluble support is something that I really, really want from a business level, especially if we can run like a carbon fiber nylon with a PVA support system. You will get so beautiful, so beautiful prints. There's really no easy way to describe just how pretty they may end up being. And I hope that Prusa does give us an update relatively soon because one, I love talking about it and two, I love reading about it because it gets me absolutely hyped. Let me know down in those comments, are you guys hyped for the XL? Do you have any gripes about it? What do you like? What do you not like? Let's have a conversation in those comments. That's all I have for you guys today. Don't forget, we have a Patreon link down below where you can come hang out with us in a Discord as well as many other perks. But stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one. Plug in the wall. That's all I really care about. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video and a massive thank you goes out to all of our Patreon and YouTube channel member supporters whose names are listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher. Right below me will be the entire series on the Prusa XL, which I think is now two or three videos. Right next to that will be a video that YouTube thinks you should watch. I think you should watch them both. I will see you guys down in those comments and in the next one. Take care.